Welcome to the Fifth Estate at the Wheeler Centre. I'm Sally Warhaft and it's a great pleasure tonight to have our three guests for our class dismissed Fifth Estate, the legacies and lessons of the late Malcolm Fraser and Gough Whitlam. And uh, of course, everybody's had a little bit of time to, to think about um, these legacies rather than uh, rushing to... To, to comment. Judith Brett is a now retired professor of politics at La Trobe University, uh, where she taught for many, many years, and uh, is also the author of numerous acclaimed books, including Robert Menzies' Forgotten People, Ordinary People's Politics, Relaxed and Comfortable, The Liberal Party's Australia, and Exit Right, The Unravelling of John Howard. And she's currently working on a biography of Alfred Deacon, which I, I can wait to read because it'll be worth the wait. Petro Giorgio was the Liberal member for the federal seat of Kuyong from 1994 till 2010. Uh, before he entered Parliament, he was a senior advisor to Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser from 1975 to 1979. And he was also the state director of the Victorian Liberal Party. He is, of course, uh, well known to all of you and uh, for his ind independent voice, uh, especially in his criticism of both parties on the issue of asylum seekers and immigration policies. And I think you were also a senior tutor in politics at La Trobe. Yes, I was. But yes. it didn't cross over. Uh, Judy and I were students together, actually, oh, in yeah. Melbourne. Politics there you go. How lovely. Very small city. And I tutored, <laughs> I tutored for Judy. So... <laughs> Barry Jones uh, is, of course, an Australian living treasure. He served in the Victorian... <laughs> yeah, give him a clap. Yes, just for... <laughs> he served in the Victorian Parliament for the Labor Party from 1972 to 1977 and was then elected uh, into the Federal House of Representatives where he remained until his retirement in 1988, he served... 1998. 1998. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> I, won't get, I won't get one mistake past this man <laughs> ever in my life. He served as national president of the ALP from 1992 till 2000 and then again from 2005 to six. And uh, he is, of course, a prolific author, and uh, his books include The Wonderful Sleeper's Wake and his autobiography, A Thinking Read. Please welcome our three wonderful guests. And I, w I want to start by asking the three of you to just respond to a very general question about these two men. Uh, Whitlam and, and Fraser, that uh, when I say Whitlam and Fraser, what comes to mind? Barry. What comes to mind really was the way in which at one stage they appeared to be deadly enemies, opponents, physically they had so much in common, Little but then in mind. their last years, in their last years, there was an extraordinary degree of convergence and that they, were, they were, were as one, for example, of issues like uh, the Republic, that they really wanted a different kind of approach to issues like asylum seekers. They were very passionately involved with, uh, with overseas aid. They wanted to rethink foreign policy. Um, and it is so extraordinary that, uh, I mean, I had the benefit in a way of knowing them both for a long time. I served on the board of uh, Care Australia for many years with, uh, with Malcolm and then uh, spent quite a bit of time with him as, as a friend in his later years and I even collected his art. I mean, as you know, he was a very expert photographer and he used to produce these uh, uh, rather erotic looking flowers uh, <laughs> which, um, uh, which I have one at home. And... Um, <laughs> I didn't uh, know that. No. But in a way, you see, it was so extraordinary that, that in, on issue after issue, they would come together. And they, to some extent, Gough was static for a while. Malcolm developed 
Malcolm changed in later years, and it was a really quite a remarkable phenomenon. We'll come back to that change because he steadfastly refused to acknowledge that he did. He always said the party changed and not him, but, but uh, we'll, we'll return to it. Judy? Well, I think, and this is sort of obvious, it's 1975 when you think of the two of them together when they're locked into that terrible, terrible destructive battle, I think destructive for both of them. And yet, then when you start to reflect, you think, well, okay, that, you know, we see the endless footage of it. We see that the young Fraser getting out of his car on his way to see Kerr refusing to answer questions. We see endlessly replayed the Kerr's Kerr quote. Um, but really, Whitlam's greatest moments were before that, I think. You know, there was the 72 election and all the work he did in transforming the Labor Party before that. And... Fraser was, in a way, that was the low point, I think, of, for him, because I think he was locked into a sort of oppositional... I, don't know the low, see, I can see Petro... But, but he was locked into a certain sort of oppositional part of his nature. And what struck me was that once he left, poli left Parliament and left that, that relentless partisan oppositionality that, that, that our Westminster system has. It was like he became, he was able to become who, a different person, but that person was sort of there in some way. But it, he, it seemed to me to be an enormously freeing thing for him. Mm. Uh, I'd like consensus. Uh, I think that Goff and Malcolm were very similar in some ways. They were coming from different philosophical directions. I think Mal Malcolm was an individualist with a significant social conscience and a commitment to social justice. Uh, Goff had similar sorts of commitments in terms of on the ground policies. One of the similarities that I think should be underscored is that they were very, very tough politically, both of them. It is impossible to, to reflect back on 75 without yeah. uh, reflecting on the fact that both Goff and Malcolm really went for it. Uh, th this was not, uh, th this was quite well balanced aggression. And indeed, if you have a look at Malcolm's life, there was quite a bit of confrontation in it. But Goff was actually described as the man who would either crash through or crash, mm. and that was his modus operandi. So, in some ways, we're talking about similarly strong partisan political styles. Uh, overlaying some very common policy elements with the difference that Malcolm did not believe in big government or thought he was fighting against it. Uh, but also I think we need to underscore the fact that the, in my judgment, the view of Malcolm having changed, and I'm sure we'll go into this for a bit, uh, is not borne out by the historical record, in, in my judgment, on most of the f fundamentals. There are some issues, um, if we talk about the American alliance, that there was a change, but I think w even when that is looked at closely, the green shoots, I think, as you said, uh, were there uh, well into the, the, into the early 70s. Uh, so those sorts of philosophical conflicts, the partisan conflicts, but some sim similarities of modes of approach, and surprisingly, a lot of similarities in terms of policy commitments in, in some very sensitive areas. So you you think he didn't change that much, Barry? You think he did? Judy, do you, do you, what do you think? I think he oh. changed a lot. You see, for example, if you take social issues, I always remember that when we had the free vote for the abolition of the death penalty in 1973, Malcolm voted to retain the death penalty. Uh, when you think of the famous Lusher motion about whether um, um, the uh, Medicare should be excluded, or rather abortion and related measures should be, he supported the Lusher motion. There were two or three quite hard line free vote things where he took the conservative line. And yet I always remember when he did the Melbourne launch of A Thinking Read, um, he spoke very movingly about the death penalty, and I thought at one stage he was actually going to cry. Uh, 
which he'd only done once before, I think, in 1983. But he, but he spoke very movingly about it, and it was, that was clearly an area where he changed dramatically. He was, of course, notoriously a super hawk uh, when, when he was in uh, Washington and he was ticking off Nixon and, uh, and uh, telling them that, you know, really, they should uh, uh, take a stronger line in dealing with the Russians and so on. That was very different. His, his approach on foreign policy was very open. And I always thought, in some ways, although this is maybe a minority view, I've always thought that Goff's greatest achievement really was taking the demonology out of foreign policy. I mean, if you look at the kind of things that people were saying about the Cold War, it was really crazy stuff, absolutely crazy stuff. And Goff, at least, you know, when he uh, went off to China and so on, that was a really a turning point. And to a very large extent, and Petro will correct me if I'm wrong, I think the Fraser foreign policy in office was very largely the Whitlam policy. I was going to say, I think when, sorry, when Fraser keeps saying, well, the party shifted and I've stayed true to the party, I think it's true that Fraser represents what's been a long historic strain in the Liberal Party, um, but it's been much stronger in the Victorian Party than it's been in the New South Wales Party. And I sometimes think what happened when is in, in the, you know, the last few decades is essentially the centre of, of political power in the Liberal Party and also in the Labor Party has shifted to New South Wales. And the, it's a much harder, tougher party system and it has been all through the 20th century. And so I think that it was, I always saw that as partly about differences between Victoria and New South Wales. I mean, Petro can probably say more about that than me. I think that there are cultural differences, but if I can just come back to what I think is the central point, it's not really about Malcolm not changing at all. Uh, I think the point about foreign policy is, is fair enough. Uh, Malcolm was a very strong cold warrior. But I think we sort of miss the point if we try to pull out one strand and say, aha, uh, because we can all do that. When I looked at the introduction of uh, FOI, which mm. Malcolm introduced and passed, sure. it struck me that Goff had actually introduced it into the House and withdrawn it on public service advice. Well, so, you know, if we're trying to untangle mm. commitments to responsibility and openness, then we see that we can actually, you know, if we look at attitudes towards refu Vietnamese refugees yeah. in the beginning, that's fairly was not a really tender-minded approach by Goff. Mm. But what I'm saying is that a lot of the things that surprise people uh, post -po in Malcolm post politics were, were actually embedded in policies and laws when he was actually Prime Minister. Multiculturalism, yeah. uh, uh, land, uh, the Northern Territory mm. land rights, uh, Wales, for God's sake, you know, yeah. Fraser Island. And Fraser Island was a significant oh, yes. source of friction with the Americans at the highest levels. Uh, didn't stop him, but, but I'm saying that that sort of... Uh, Malcolm in persona may have looked quite different, or I think looked quite different from one to the other, but in terms of substantive continuity, I can see a hell of a lot more continuity than discontinuity. And that's also saying that he did continue a lot of uh, the seeds that Whitlam had planted because he actually embraced them himself and had embraced them beforehand. Well, he was always very good on race, always very good on race. And I think in some ways on the Vietnamese refugees, frankly, he was better than Goff. Goff was rather reluctant. He did go along and provide bipartisan support, but it was Malcolm who, Malcolm who really drove that. Of course, but it's also true that when, um, when Malcolm knocked off Billy Snedden as the leader, uh, Snedden was seen as sort of leader of the progressives, and Malcolm was really the paladin of the right when he knocked him, when he knocked him off. And of course, it was one of the silliest things that Goff ever did and there are a few contested areas there, <laughs> when, he, when he destroyed, um, when he destroyed some... I actually had been in the house, quite by accident, 
happened to be in the house the day that he did that he did, did um, Billy Snedden in and, and humiliated him and made him just look foolish. And I always remember looking at the faces of the people on the front bench behind Snedden. They were all sort of examining their nails and, and trying not to... Uh, as if they weren't observing what was going on. But he really did him in. And whether he would have... Do you think, he, do you think Snedden would have survived if, Malcolm, if, if he hadn't been done in by Whitlam? Uh, I think that a lot of the time, not just in this case, uh, Prime Ministers go a tiny bit mad in destroying leaders of the opposition that they perceive as being weak, mm. Mm. and it's not always in their interests, and yeah. I, I can bring that right up to date. <laughs> did, um, did Whitlam change after he left office? Well, Barry said he thought he stalled a little. I'd be interested to hear... Judy, he didn't the change. His, he he was because what he was inclined to do was to look back on what he saw as his great achievements. It was a matter of vindicating the record. He wasn't altogether setting out a new new era, except perhaps with his work with UNESCO, which was which was original and where he played quite an important role in UNESCO. He succeeded me, or rather he preceded me in UNESCO, and I heard a lot about the good that he did there. But that aside, I don't know that he was really developing new, new policy uh, areas altogether, but of course he wanted to write the history. That was his preoccupation. And uh, he did write a bit of hagiography uh, about himself. And, uh, Is that possible? But he also had that, but he did have a quality of self-mockery about him, which I found really quite, which I found quite agreeable. And uh, it was very funny, the very last time uh, he was filmed, somebody was making a documentary, and uh, um, Anyway, they said, could they see Mr. Whitlam in his office? And I said, oh, look, I don't think it's appropriate. He's 96. It wouldn't, wouldn't be right. Anyway, we rang up the Whitlam office and uh, Goff, um, and rather surprised, they said, oh, no, 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 we'd, no we'd, we'd, we'd love to see that. So the result is when we went in, and the situation was I was going into the Whitlam office and greeting Goff, and you see Goff immediately thundered and said, what is this outrage? People sweeping in here, taking out of the office. This is absolutely absurd. And, so, and anyway, the people who are making the film said, oh, I don't think we can use that. It looks, <laughs> it looks a bit strange. So we did it again and it was sort of softened down, softened down. But I said to the guy who's, who directed it, hasn't, hasn't been shown yet, I said, have you kept the original film? And he said, well, of course. But Goff... <laughs> Goff was an old stager, and he liked, he liked to show off, and he liked to make... He had those continuing interests, like, for example, uh, the, uh, the Bastards of the House of Hanover. That was a recurrent theme of interest to him. And the, and the adulteries of royal families of the Balkans. There's been no Australian <laughs> Prime Minister... There's been no Australian Prime Minister who's had anything like that degree of knowledge in those two areas. <laughs> I um, I always get I get the feeling that um, Whitlam's legacy is much more confined to his time in office, yes. whereas Malcolm's is actually, for for me, more outside after. Um, mm. And I wonder, Judy, is that yeah, well, fair? It, 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 it seemed to me that cause, that Whitlam, af after 80, 87, 77, um, effectively stood aside from domestic politics and got yeah. on with his own interests. And I, I was thinking about that and thinking, is that something to do with the difference between the two men or is it to do with the parties and the party traditions? I mean, effectively, Whitlam got himself out of the way so that the Labor Party could could deal with the trauma of, of the Whitlam period and, and, of, and, and rebuild itself, which they effectively did. So in that sense, he did a great service to the party, but he stood aside, really, from domestic politics, whereas Fraser after a, a period, did the opposite. C can I just throw yeah. something in there? I, yeah. I don't differ, but I, I think it's also the balance of lives uh, that Goff actually invested a huge amount of very productive life before he became Prime Minister, uh, 
which reforming the Labor Party, yeah. uh, the policy development. So in some respects, no, that's not, yes, not, yes, to, no, con yes, not I, to contradict your point, no, but in yes. some respects, he put d done 20 years of work to get Labor competitive yeah. and it actually mm. reformed the system quite fundamentally. Yeah. So, but there's one thing that, touching on, on Goff and uh, his sense of humour, when uh, John Gordon had his memorial service in Sydney, you might recollect the famous outburst from uh, Tom Hughes slang Malcolm for having betrayed John Gordon. He, he gave the eulogy and yeah. there he was. And afterwards, Goff came up to me and said, Conrad, you conservatives have very interesting memorials. He said, I have mine all set up perfectly. It's at the People's Palace. It's all organised. Everybody knows what they're going to do. But you never know what they do when you're not there to supervise them. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is quite... But it was, it was all pat. Paul Kelly wrote about Fraser that his dominance of his own time is not matched by his imprint upon history. Is that fair, Petro? Uh, I think a lot of the argument uh, that, that Kelly mounts is that Malcolm did not make mount the major economic reforms that Paul thought were really fundamental ten years later. Uh, it's not, it's not but, just but, Paul Kelly, though, uh, that would argue no, that, is no, but, it? No, yeah. but you quoted yeah. him, so... Yeah. But, but that, yeah. that, that, that's not restricted mm. to Paul Kelly. It's held by mm. a significant number of Liberals. Mm. Uh, I, I think that there is a degree of... Uh, ex post facto judgment that I don't think could have been applied at the time, certainly, and I was around in those days, uh, despite the so-called influence of the dryers, uh, there wasn't a major demand that Malcolm go harder at that particular point. Uh, my recollection, distinct recollection of the first budget, the 76 budget, 76-7 budget was, Yes, yeah. uh, was that it was thought to be draconic, mm. uh, that everybody thought that Malcolm was going too far. But certainly, uh, you can point at things where Malcolm did go in for some deregulation, did uh, initiate the Campbell inquiry. I think it's fair to say that his progress on that was slow in implementation, but I also think that the forces against that, especially in part, on the part of Treasury and Reserve Bank, were huge. But um, if you want to say he was not a full-fledged free marketeer, yeah. I could not but differ. But I think I that, could not differ. that relevant there is the fact that that period from mm. 75 through probably to well, the early to middle 80s is one of policy flux. Mm. So mm. He, he happens to be Prime Minister mm. in a period when the post-war boom has ended um, and the policy makers are actually reasonably confused about, you know, there's stagflation is here, it shouldn't happen, we don't really know how to respond to it. So to act, it, it seems to me Kelly's being a bit, I agree with you, a bit unfair because it's hard to know... I mean, I don't think anybody at that point could have done the reforming because those yeah. ideas hadn't as yet sort of gelled. They, they, yeah. they were there, they, people were thinking about them, but they hadn't turned into the sort of program which by the middle 80s was starting to become pretty clear and which then... I mean, Kelly writes that book in 92 with, yeah. with, quite, with, with a lot of hindsight because then we can see the sort of patterns, um, you know, yeah. that they've emerged. So... Equally, if you were talking about green shoots, you, have to, you do have to talk about... Campbell and the basis for deregulation, yeah. you do have to understand the, the bureaucratic process. Uh, and um, I also think, in fairness to Malcolm, uh, that you have to understand some people have got, had a real interest in rewriting history. Yeah. I think it's true, though, that he was very critical of what he saw as being an extreme position <laughs> taken by Thatcher. And he didn't like some of the aspects of the you know, the free market approach because he thought there were too many victims yep. and uh, he thought that uh, really the, the state did have a role and this is where, uh, although um, uh, John Howard was far from being the first person in the, in the you know, the free market mm. cart, um, there were, were others like Jim Carlton who were there much earlier and of course the, the famous modest member Bert Kelly had been uh, arguing for it. But... Um, Malcolm uh, was uh, 
did drag the chain a bit on that on that issue, and he was very not not happy with some of the direction that was let, later on taken about. Uh, Malcolm was not a full deregulationist. He he was a significant interventionist, uh, and there's no sorry, I'm yeah. certainly not running away from that. But what I'm saying is he also did take steps, but he was unwilling to float the dollar. He was willing to have a dirty float, but he was unwilling yeah. to float the dollar. He did not believe in full bank deregulation because he thought the people had to be protected against the banks. Uh, and from the benefit of hindsight, with the benefit of hindsight, some people did have to be protected from the banks. Most of us. <laughs> and I think it's also important. I mean, he's quite. He was quite close to, and he understood the sort of interests and the predicament of country Australia. Um, and I think that's really important in understanding why he was a little wary of some of the um, deregulation, because actually the country, country, rural Australia got pretty screwed during the 1980s and into the 90s. I think you also reflected back on that they got very badly screwed in the 30s. Yeah, and, and, yeah. No, that, that was that sort of heritage. He, he never lost and I never yeah. think he wanted to lose it. And he also had a very good working relationship with mm. people like Doug Anthony and Peter Nixon and Sinclair and, and mm. some of the other. And in fact, I remember in the period when I was, the, my first term in the parliament, which was um, immediately after 77, um, that those uh, national party ministers were very effective parliamentarians, terrific parliamentarians. And they played a role that was very significant and they were very supportive of him. I wonder um, what you what you think if there's <laughs> Whitlam and Fraser straddled two eras in a way a little bit in that it was Whitlam that brought in the the era of the the soundbite with its time so it was a changing political culture and and he was very adept obviously he was a great performer very polished you wonder what he'd do today in in our our media, political culture. Now, I wonder if you can think of a, a, a sort of is there is there a legacy of of them in our culture today, or has it evaporated? Look, I, I think its time was really a kind of a political anomaly. I think it worked very well, but I think Gough really uh, wanted to do a three quarter an hour speech about the history of time and how it evolved. <laughs> and uh, I think just doing it in a couple of words didn't really, didn't really count. I mean, the thing about Goff was, and it often drove people mad, but if there was a policy that he wanted to explain, he'd go on and on and on relentlessly. Nobody ever said, I wonder what Whitlam really thinks about uniform <laughs> rail gauges or about ratification of ILO conventions because he would talk about it absolutely endlessly. And that was his great strength. And uh, in a way, you, couldn't, you might not remember the detail, but you, at least you knew here was somebody who had what uh, Clem Lloyd called this remorseless didacticism and that he wanted to teach. He was a teacher. He was essentially a teacher, and that's all gone. And now they are looking at that sense of saying, well, what, who's going to win today's news events? Who's going to be seen, say, oh, yesterday was a bad day for them, but tomorrow will be a better day for them? Whitlam wasn't thinking about that. He, was th he really was thinking in terms of decades. Well, I, I think that the sound grabs, I mean, the 30-second sound grabs may have been dreams then, Oh, keep it tight, Prime Minister, keep it tight. But uh, I, I don't think that they were the sorts of politicians that had adapted to it. Uh, I'm not sure Gough wanted to adapt to it perfectly, no. and certainly Malcolm was on about running a stable, solid government. Uh, made, and he wasn't good at uh, the glitz of... He Much as I love him, he the, wasn't the, good the at that. The charming no. uh, weekly radio broadcast that he did from his, his actual country radio station for years, which uh, I thought was very old-fashioned and rather lovely. No, it was very modern when he started it. Well... No, 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 <laughs> sorry, no. Judy? That's unfair. No, it was... It, no, and that was... It's all being digitised, by the way. You can access them, and they go back to 1955. 
Goodness. And, mm. Yeah, hundreds of them. <laughs> no, I, I was thinking, you know, this sense of the contrast between those two men and the present. I mean, it's not just in the media. And it seems to me that the war is really important in understanding that difference. I mean, Whitlam fought in the war and for Fraser it would have been it would have loomed over his yeah. teenage years and his and and mm. and his mm. early adulthood. Um, and it gave them a sort of seriousness of purpose, which meant that whether winning or losing this day's media event was not what they were in politics about. They weren't in there just to win or lose. That there was a, in both of them and I think in many, I mean, in Hamer too, you can see that, and in many of the politicians of that generation, a, a real yep. seriousness about the purpose, about nation building and, and, and what they were there for. And I think that's one of the things that is... There's not quite the same confidence in the seriousness of many of the people who are our current yeah. politicians. Can, can, I, I can I just agree with that? Because entirely, uh, it struck me that both Goff and Malcolm, and Malcolm to a much lesser extent, had sort of looked over the edge of the abyss. Yeah. And that gave them both a weight and a ponderousness uh, that it's difficult to translate into contemporary generations. Uh, and, and one of the things that distinguished both of them was, for good or ill, they looked like substantive people. Mm. They, they looked as if they had gravitas and weight behind them. And I think that, that <laughs> the impact of war and depression uh, had mm. something to do with that. But look, but, but you're right. yeah. mm. I was going to say that there's something that it's, I've been thinking about a lot since Markham died, and I'm not sure that I know what the answer um, is, but my friends on the panel might. You had a, a very strong... Scottish Presbyterian tradition in Australian public life. Mm. Going back, I mean, George uh, Reid had it, uh, um, uh, uh, Andrew Fisher came from it, uh, Bruce came from it, Menzies came from it, uh, Fraser came from it, McEwen came from it, but other people like Ian McPhee, Billy mm. Seddon even. Where have they gone? That tradition has simply disappeared. D Dick Hamer was in that category. Ninian Stephen was in that category. That group has simply disappeared. And I don't know where they've gone to. Well, where, where did you, when did you last meet a Presbyterian? <laughs> I mean, the Presbyterians have disappeared, really. Well, well in, when I, whenever I go to a funeral at Scottish <laughs> Church, there seems to be practically every week. Yes, but, they, but they're, you know... But, that's, where, that's where they're going. I mean, it's, a diff, it's another issue, but the... There's been, like, religion has waned as a social cultural really force about, massively. In, not in religion, really, but in terms of a, a cultural milieu. Mm. Or, but an, I, or, or I, an ethos. Hmm? That, or an ethos that's, that just yeah. wafts around. You know, but it, like, the, it's all gone. What they seem to have in common to me was that they could both imagine the future. In, in a yes. way that our current leadership on both sides, on all sides, every direction you look, seemed just completely incapable of. And I'm wondering if that was because they were big men, they had big egos, whether in that future they were always part of it and so they, they would project into it, or whether, um, it, I don't know, we're just, pre we're just pre presenting deficient people I, in I politics think... now. I think, Sally, it's, it's also because, and it's linked to what I was saying about the war and Petro added in the Depression, they, they, had, they had a past which, and their politics came out of a past and came out of experience. And so, you know, people's temporal imaginations include the future and the past. And I don't get the sense at the moment with very many of our politicians that they've got a very strong sense of, of, of historically where they've yeah. come from. Um, and so it's not surprising that they don't have a particularly strong sense of what's happening in the society at the moment, what the forces are that are, that are driving towards the future. I, I think that groundedness is, is a real point. Mm. Uh, but, but I just, without defending anyone, I, I think that some of the meanings of, of what's happening now takes a while to understand yeah, I think where that's it came true. from. 
and I, I've known Malcolm, knew Malcolm for 40 years, and uh, the Presbyterian thing didn't really strike me, although it may well have been, and it's just really difficult to understand the wellsprings. I think sociological fa facts like war and depression are there, uh, but isolation as a child, I can't, yeah, oh. I can't make, I can't make sense of it. Although it strikes me as being relevant, but uh, you know, I, I think with some of some of the people that succeeded them, we just have to wait and see that we may we may come to understand them a bit better. Mm. Mm. Whoever these people are, they're not going into politics. That's what I'm saying. Mm. They may be mm. going into banking. They may be, they're, mm. but they're, they're not going into politics. That's the one thing they had in common with them. Uh, they, all, they both thought that public life was a very important and politics was, was um, as Mindy said, more important than business. And yeah, I think yeah. both yeah. those men uh, shared that perspective. It was an honourable profession and it shouldn't be uh, downplayed uh, compared with the, the, the captains of industry. You know? yeah. and, and they felt that quite strongly, I think. When uh, Goff died, Tanya Plebiscek remarked that he made reforms that her party, the ALP, wouldn't dare make today. Oh, yeah. why, why is that? Because, first of all, Goff was able to get the support of people with whom he didn't have much in common, perhaps, temperamentally or even ideologically, but because they wanted to win. They wanted to break the losing cycle. So you had people, uh, you know, like Fred Daly, who wouldn't have agreed on any social issue with Goff, but who simply said, he can win an election and no one else can, so I'm prepared to support him. So it meant that Goff was able to project his own image and able to remake the party to a very large extent. But the rise and rise of factionalism has meant that, first of all, you've got um, the, the factions have really become executive, executive placement agencies. And the party has become less and less democratic in structure and more and more oligarchic uh, in structure. And so from that point of view, uh, the big decisions about who's the leader and who's not going to be the leader are really made essentially by the factional heavies that in the end, the, the, the vote coming in, say, from the uh, membership doesn't really count because if you can detach a, a sizable group of factional players, say, in the caucus, that determines the election. Now, Goff, to a very large extent, the situation was less factionalised then. And the question that was uh, preeminent in their thinking was, is he a winner? Is he capable of winning? If he's capable of winning, we'll, we'll give him some kind of latitude and so on. It's not like that now. It's a much tighter situation. Judy, when you were doing your research for ordinary people's yeah. politics, so talking to normal people, not the political class, yeah. was there a sense of, of, of Whitlam and Fraser in those stories? Did they loom larger um, than others or, or not? Not really, I don't think. I mean, the thing that struck me was most people were not, they don't even marginally interested in politics. They saw politicians as having a job and that was their job to do certain things and what they most wanted from their politicians was competence. That's what struck me, that they weren't after the vision thing. They, you know, there's obviously there's some groups that are, but most ordinary people wanted to feel that they could trust the politicians to, to do the job to govern, really, in the, the, the old way that the Liberal Party used to see itself as a party of government and of experience. And, they, and under Menzies, for example, um, the Liberal, Liberal governments didn't come in with lots of policies to implement. They came in to run the country, uh, you know, manage the external events, manage contingencies. So that was my... And so they didn't really talk, talk that much about it. But there is an idealisation of Whitlam out there. I, I would come across that among students who would enrol in politics and when we'd be... People would say... They would have... They, I used to get students to do this little 
um, exercise in the first class to write their first political memory. It was a good way of, you know, good icebreaker, and I got to find out a bit about them and be able to play, you know. Uh, and a lot of times there would be things to do with Whitlam that would be in that first political memory. A Greek student remembering his grandmother throwing things at the television when Fraser came on. Um, Couldn't have been Greek. We only, <laughs> we only had one television. We would not have broken it. <laughs> No, but they didn't break it. But, but you know, that anger or remember, remembering seven, the drama of 75, remembering the 83 election. So that the drama of that period, I think, you know, has been really important in popular political memory. I, I think just there's one issue that's always puzzled me about how, you know, radical Goff was and how much the radicalism was a product of the compression and speed of change. A lot of the things, a lot of the things, and I'm not taking any, but I, th I thought that some of the changes were really major. But as important as th the magnitude of the changes was the comp compression of time in which they were, mm -hmm. in which they were accomplished. I mean, you know, that that speed was was uh, was really important, and I think that one of the the outcomes of the Whitlam government was an, an attempt to slow down. Not mm. the direction of change in many areas, and Medicare is a, the Medibank's a good case on this one, uh, but rather the the uh, spreading it out over further time. And also but, the yeah. sense of drama. I mean, mm. I remember yeah. one of the things Fraser promised mm. was to get politics off the front mm. page, you know, to get back mm. to a sense of the country being governed, people mm. would go about their mm. business, and yeah. But, no, but I think no. what happened was you had that very long period of of Menzies, where Menzies, in a sense, was running an existing system right. and somewhat resistant to social change. Then you had the short period with Holt, and Holt did a lot in immigration and he did a lot of Aboriginal affairs. Then came the Vietnam War. Then you had the shambles of, of the, the, you know, the Gorton-McMahon period. And then when Whitlam came in, there was a, a big list of things which from his point of view, a big shopping mm. list that, that he incorporated in the platform. Yes, the platform. And, uh, <laughs> and so the result is that there was always that sense that there were a tremendous number of policies that had to come, and you had to move them quickly. And we've been wasting time. It wasting yeah. time. And as he always used to say, that the, the best of all the Whitlam cabinets was the first one, <laughs> when they only had two, the two ministers. <laughs> and as he said, he began to think that maybe even that one had been too big. <laughs> um, we'll go to audience questions in a moment. So if you'd like to ask a question, put your hand up. Um, and if an usher comes towards you, we'll, we'll get to it. But I, I, I just uh, I'd like some remarks first on... It, Australian politics is so full of hate and loathing, and, uh, and I don't think there's, well, there's perhaps one contender for bigger hurt than what mm. uh, Malcolm inflicted on, on Goff, but their reconciliation was quite un-Australian and, and quite touching, I thought. How important is, is it to their legacy? Why do you think it was un-Australian, Sally? I don't yeah, think it was un-Australian Because I just all. think of yeah. so many bruising fallouts that never get repaired. Mm. Well, it, it, in public well, life in Australia that don't actually get repaired. But it was, I, I think they, uh, they linger. I think that reflects a particular perspective about the nature of the conflict. Yeah. Uh, basically, supply between the two leaders was a major political conflict. And that's the way I think they took it. The, the, yeah. the person who... Uh, was either a victim or a villain, uh, and really the only remaining thing about the blocking supply was actually John Kerr, and more pointedly, should Kerr have adv advised Goff? Uh, but I, th I think that despite th the drama and the intensity of that conflict, it was in one sense just politics, and after, mm. after it was resolved, it was resolved, mm. apart with the exception of Kerr. Well, it was interesting, the other day, I, well, not the other day, but after Goff died, I was talking to John Faulkner about this, and I said I'd always thought that, you know, if you are going to allocate blame, that's from Labor's point of view, you would have said 70% Kerr to blame, 
30% Fraser. And Faulkner, who was closer to Whitlam than anyone, said, I wouldn't put it like that. He said, I'd put it 100% zero. He said, Fraser was simply doing what opposition leaders do. He was acting politically. What was unacceptable about Kerr was that Kerr was acting politically. It was a political intervention and it was not his role to take a political intervention. And I think that, to some extent, must reflect yeah. what Goff yeah, had said yeah. to him. Mm. Yeah, and and th those sorts of... Some things you don't forgive, other things are just part of the game. Don't yeah. Uh, so, as I said, Goff played pretty hard too. Question. Um, thank you for the talk. I think my question is probably to Judith, maybe. Um, a lot of the conversation, uh, the discussion tonight was around the post prime ministerial period of, of Fraser and Whitlam. Um, I'm just interested as to what you think the role is of Australian prime ministers nowadays post their stewardship as prime minister because the succeeding prime ministers, um, uh, well, Fairfax is claiming that Kevin Rudd may become the secretary general of the UN, but that seems a long shot still. But no one post Fraser has had really any significant impact um, uh, as a Prime Minister. What, what, do you see a role for um, Prime Ministers post their period in the role? Because they develop incredible wisdom and knowledge of the world and knowledge of the structures in the country and uh, just general uh, the general ideas that they would have uh, will be quite remarkable. But they seem to now retreat. Um, you know, Gillard has gone, done a Bradman and gone to Adelaide and we really don't hear about her and right. John Howard. No, good point. Um, well... I think in Howard's case, you know, he was quite old by the time he finishes. So it seems to me to go into a, a, a gracious retirement was appropriate. Um, one of the things that I'm, I've been thinking about is why when people lose, they leave Parliament. I don't... Uh, I mean, I can understand that in Howard's case, and I suppose, you know... But Gillard didn't actually have to leave. Um, you know, th that... Um, so, in a way, I would rather they stuck around in people... You know, in Costello, I mean, he wasn't Prime Minister, but it's a good example that this... ..that when people leave, Keating didn't need to leave. You know, they're young enough to have stayed there. Men, you know, but I suppose because I worked on Menzies... Are I they young see... enough to bring them back, Judy? Is it...? <laughs> 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 but, I mean, Menzies had, was massively humiliated in his first Prime Ministership and he could have left and he would have been, a, you know... Mm. Bit more, only a bit more than a footnote now, really. Mm. Um, so when people are going into politics reasonably young and getting there quite young, uh, get, you know, getting into prime minister, you know, cabinet ministers and, and the prime minister position <coughs> quite young, I think it's unfortunate that they somehow then think that they should leave and go on and make serious money, which is what Hawke seemed to think he should do. But that, that's really complex. Sorry, the issue is really complex yeah. because when you see the ones that stayed, and I can think of some of them, Billy Hughes, who's a... Yeah, well, that's true. Billy Hughes could have so, kept Kevin it. Rudd. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Kevin Rudd. Uh, yeah, Kevin uh, Rudd. McMahon hung around. Mm. And, and I think that some of them actually did form a judgment at the time that the party or the, yeah. would be better off. I, I think the, the other side of the coin yeah. is... Why don't, and this is true, I think, of Liberals, why don't governments use their prime mm. minister, their former prime ministers better than, than they do? Now, this is, you know, yeah. this is not something that I'd point particularly at Labor, because Labor was... And, in fact, why Goff, doesn't Australia Goff, Goff do it was, better, sorry, full stop? Yeah, uh, uh, Hawke was good with Malcolm and, and the mm. uh, uh, Commonwealth... The Commonwealth uh, yeah, you know, Rudd was no, but but there is a real issue there that oh, it's always mm. puzzled me. Why the Americans why, are much better yeah, at it, aren't much they? Much better at mm. it. Yeah. Mm. Well, I I think I think problem. I can understand from their point of view they don't want to be a mm. focus of an alternative view because there's a danger that they're seen even by people in the community as a whole as being another focus of power. And that, I think, can be disturbing. And sometimes they're mischievous. Because yes. I remember Billy mm. McMahon sometimes. I'd get into the office early and the phone would ring and a voice would say, it's Billy. <laughs> and then he'd say, why don't you ask Malcolm? Yes. And then he'd dictate a very, very vicious question. <laughs> yes. 
Which were used. Can't, can't, <laughs> can't be so. <laughs> We've got a question at the front here. Thank you. Thank you very much, all three speakers. Fabulous. I'm curious to know, um, it's been reported that Malcolm Fraser was working for the last four years on developing a new party, one that he wasn't going to lead, but one which looked to the future with vision. Do any of you know about that and what's likely to happen to it for the future? Ooh, we're well. all being quiet, aren't we? <laughs> I think we all could answer Australia that. or something like that. Barry, I think we'll swing that one to you. Yeah. Oh, look, Malcolm's concern was this, and I, and I share his concern. If you've got an election coming up, you know that there were, uh, leaving the Greens aside, there will be no serious debate on a number of major issues. If you take asylum seekers, for example, there'll be essentially the Labor position and the, and the coalition position, and essentially that they converge. Who would you vote for if you wanted to have an alternative position? Similarly, if you wanted really, if you wanted even, say, an issue like Gonski, if you wanted Gonski really implemented, who's going to do it? Well you'd have to say, not the two existing parties. So the result was that Malcolm was really looking at the possibility that you had a, a focus. I mean, I sort of half-jokingly described it could be called the Courage Party, which came out with a whole series of policies which were courageous and which were principled and so on, but where the option simply wasn't there. As it is, it's, uh, I think we're so used to the present two-party system. 80% of all our voters, it doesn't matter whether it's state election or federal election, will vote for the two major parties. So I think people are voting in a simply pragmatic way to say, well, we've got elected a government and that's all there is to it. So I think the prospect of having an alternative force, no matter, no matter how desirable it might be, to, so that there's a proper degree of debate, I don't know what will happen. But uh, Malcolm was certainly central to the whole idea. It's a very interesting discussion and a great panel you have there. Uh, when I think of the Whitlam government, the thing that comes to, there are many things that come to mind, of course, for all of us, but with me in particular, the thing that um, has stuck in my mind is a, co is a quote by Jim Cairns in describing the Whitlam government. And I'd like your response to this. And um, I remember Jim Keynes saying that, um, describing the government as thus, we were, we were all a bunch of, most of us were um, just a, a group of optimistic young men who'd just been demobilised from the war. We went into Parliament full of optimism and looking to change the world. Unfortunately, we spent the best years of our lives in opposition. So by the time we got into government, we were no longer the optimistic young men that we were when we went in but mostly a bunch of bitter and twisted old men looking to use the process of government, the apparatus of government, to settle old scores. I'd like a response to that, and do you think there's any validity in that? So by the time people actually get did, into power, they've, uh, they've lost their... Well, did, uh, did Cairns actually say that? Well, yeah. I, 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 doubt, I, I succeeded Cairns in his seat. And I... Um, thought in a way um, he was certainly disappointed that a number of the things that he wanted to do hadn't been achieved as he wanted them. So from that point of view, he was uh, disappointed and saddened and so on. But still, um, you know, he stayed around for a while and then, then I was elected in, in, in 77. I think that's a very um, exaggerated view. I mean, strangely, I mean, it was certainly true that when he died, Goff said we never had a cross word. That's true because they never spoke. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, in a way, in a way I, I've, I've actually, I had quite a lot to do with Cairns and I inherited a number of his staff. Um, and I'll talk about that some other time. But I inherited some of his staff. <laughs> and, uh, but I never heard him express that view and I knew him pretty well. I just say on that, it does seem to me that that incredibly long period of opposition was obviously very debilitating 
for, for Labor and I also think for the country. And I've always thought that it would have been much better if Menzies had lost the 1961 election. I think um, that was the one he won by, you know, on communist yeah. preferences. You yeah. know, it was the credit squeeze election. If he'd lost that, he was quite old by then, um, he probably would have retired and it would have it would have freed the way for the Liberal Party, for the reforming energies that were building up, around, in the, which Holt represented, um, much earlier. And you wouldn't have got this terrible sort of, this build-up of the backlog that Barry talked about, so that when Whitlam, when Labor finally got in 72, it was, there were so many things to do in such a short time, and the, um, the long po post-war boom ended. You know, they got hit by, yeah. by, the, by the economic problems. And I think we would have had a much more, a much, the country would have had much longer to debate and think about the changes around race and immigration and about Aboriginal affairs, and it wouldn't have got polarised into this sort of Labor Liberal thing in quite the same way. So, and, and I mean, what would have, we would have ended up with Corwell as Prime Minister, which. That would have definitely cracked it's the right to, um, It's that hard to. <laughs> to think how that would have played out, but you know he was an intelligent man, and it, and you know there were there was talent in that party, and but it, it certainly I think would have been much better for the Liberal Party. Mm. I was just going to say that as there was even five or six years later. Yeah, that's true. Mm. I was just going to say that uh, the White Australia policy definitely would have been cracked out. No, mm. under, yeah. Under, yeah. Uh, uh, I think that the, the other point is that they were out for a long time, and they got detached from the experience yeah. of government, both mm -hmm. in terms of capacities and in terms of understanding of limits. And I yeah. think that... Yeah. And one of, the, one of the problems with the Whitlam government was that they had a lot of problems with their ministers. Mm. You know, that, that sort of was, mm. was boiling over and the relationship between departments and ministers always complex, was even more complex. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Really briefly, because we're out of time, mm. if you had to think of a single sort of achievement, with either of them, not mm. both of them, what, what uh, it's, a, it's a lot to choose from, but what do you appreciate the most, I suppose, that, that one of the two uh, achieved? Petro. Uh, I really appreciated Malcolm's uh, capacity to embrace diversity, both in, in an immigration sense and in terms of an abandonment of an assimilationist policy that had never worked and was never going to work. And I, I just think it's remarkable, I don't know why I think it's remarkable, that it came from somebody who seemed so stereotypically Anglo-Saxon and establishment. Mm -hmm. I think um, it was with Whitlam, for me it was, you know, and I had to teach, you know, I've taught this period in history a lot, was this sense of a watershed, that, that there was a change in the political agenda in some large scale way that, that I think was Whitlam's, it was like a major symbolic achievement, mm. I think, of, of Whitlam, that he made Australians feel differently about themselves and feel differently about what their society was like and what it could achieve. They both had a global view. They both, t and they both thought in the long term and they had a, a historic sense. And the other thing, from a personal point of view, I'd say they were both fun to be with. Very dry times. Ah, <laughs> oh, you three are fun to be with. It's um, been an absolute pleasure. Please give uh, Judith, Brett, Petro, Giorgio and Barry Jones a big thank you.